What's going on, everyone? My name is Andrew Allen Fish. This is the Nutrient Health Project podcast. This is episode number six. We're going to talk about cultivating some calm. So because we're still in the first couple episodes of this podcast, as you may be accustomed to, I'm going to kind of introduce who I am and what I'm doing here. So I am a personal trainer, nutrition coach, strength coach. I've been doing this for about 11, almost 12 years now. I really need to look back and see what the date is that I started. So I know that for sure. But my mission with this podcast is to basically help people understand maybe some concept things that they either don't have the time or don't have the curiosity to to dive down all of these available rabbit holes in this day and age of the internet and help simplify some things. So you're not going to hear super detailed, super complex things on this podcast unless I get those specific questions. I'm definitely more than happy to go down rabbit holes with you. My goal here is to try to simplify things, right? Um, we have enough information. We have enough, if you want complicated, complicated is is out there. What I feel like we don't have in the health and fitness industry is people making things simple, but also effective. I feel like people can make them simple, but maybe they're not effective or they can make them effective, but they're not really that simple, right? They're way too complex. So my job is to make these complex things simple and to make them still effective and help you. So we're taking a brief foray in just these first couple of episodes and really like nailing down home some of the basics. So, you know, we, we've, we've talked about kind of like if you're not hitting your goals, some reasons why you may not be hitting them in, in past episodes. We've talked about the 75 day challenge, which is metamorphosized into something much cooler that uh, Holly and I are doing and that I'm excited to announce here in, in the coming months. But The last episode, we talked about journaling, and today's episode, we're actually going to talk about meditation and why meditation is important and the problems with meditation and and what you can expect to gain from meditation. So with all of that, thank you for taking the time to listen, and let's get this presentation going. And as I always say in the beginning of these episodes, if you're listening to it, I appreciate you listening to it. If you want to watch these, I also upload videos of these presentations to YouTube, uh, just under my name, Andy Frisch. You can find us there. You can also find us pretty much on every social media platform under Nutrient Official or Andy Frisch, or I think it's Relentless Andrew on Instagram, if you are interested in connecting with us. So with all that, let's get this party started. One of the the biggest benefits to uh, a consistent meditative process is in, in cultivating calm, obviously, right? The title here. But cultivating calm is important because it's that whole thing of like our thoughts become our become our words, our words become our actions, our actions become our habits, our habits become our character and our character become our destiny, becomes our destiny, right? If you think about that, it all starts with thought and it ends with destiny. So if it starts with thought and it ends with destiny, like maybe the first thing that we should kind of focus on is the quality of our thought. And a lot of times the quality of our thought will come down to cultivating some calm. So one of the most effective ways I've found personally in cultivating calm, especially in today's day and age, is through meditation. Also journaling, which if you haven't listened to episode five, go back and listen to that. But journaling and meditation on top of like my working out, right? The, the working out helps give me calm for my body. Uh, fasting helps give me calm for my body and digestion. Meditation and journaling help give me calm for my mind. And without a calm mind, without a calm body, without a calm soul, like you're not going to get a lot done in this day and age. I have the mental image of like a dog who's been locked up in the house or left in the car, right? They're freaking out. They're not doing too good. They're not doing a whole lot of productive things. They're probably chewing up books and chewing through your couch and all that. So if you can cultivate calm, if you can can cultivate calm in your body, your mind, and your spirit, you're going to be you know, a lot better off at, at progressing through life and having a good, fulfilling life. So the, the perceived problem with meditation, though, as I'm doing this podcast, like full transparency, I feel like this will probably be one of the lowest listened to episodes that I record because this isn't sexy. This isn't like a diet hack. This isn't like this new supplement will help you lose 10 pounds in two days. It's meditation. It's like it's boring shit. And it's it's things that it's like most things that are really good for us, they take time and they're an investment on the front end, right? You're not going to start meditating 
today and notice results tomorrow. Like you might notice you're a little more relaxed or something instantly, but usually after you sit down for 10 minutes and you meditate, you might wake up feeling relaxed, but when you go right into your normal day thing, if you're not carrying that meditation with you, it's only a matter of a few minutes, if not seconds, before like the the stress of the world kicks in and catches up to you. So it's like, it takes time to build up the reps, just like it does in the gym. It takes time to build up the reps of meditation to where you really notice a consistent benefit. But hell, like time is the one asset that we all have, right? So why not put the time into it? Why not make the investment in yourself and your future mind? I talked about in the journal episode that I recorded earlier, like your the whole thing of journaling is you're capturing a snapshot of your brain at that point, whether it's two months ago or five years ago or 10 years ago. So why not make the investment now for the future brain that you're hoping to have to, to increase the quality of your thought and again, cultivate some of that calm. So another problem with meditation is, is it's, it's kind of piggybacking off of like it takes time and it's an investment. Most things that take time, most things that are an investment, like if you invest money in the stock market and you think you're going to make, you know, a hundred thousand or, or a million dollars, shout out like AMC and GameStop. But if you think you're going to make like a large amounts of, of money in the next day or week, or maybe even a month, like that's really sexy and that really grabs your attention. But if you invest that same amount of money and you're going to get that same return, but it's going to be like 20 years when you get that return, it's like, eh, like, nah, I would just rather keep my money. Even though it's the exact same return, we're just not good at like playing that long-term game. So because it takes time, because it's an investment, it's just not that sexy. It's not that cool. Again, you're not going to see a lot of like, and you will see people posting on, on Instagram about meditation, but like you're going to see way more of like the get fit quick, get rich quick, right? Get healthy quick things. Some of the things I see on there too just boggle my mind, but I won't throw any shade at it. One other perceived problem with meditation is like people view it as, and, and it's, it's rightly so. Sometimes it's been tied into meditation, right? I could even make uh, a case for like prayer being a form of meditation, but people tie meditation into religion. And I don't think it needs to be that. I think you can be a Christian or a Hindu or a Buddhist or, or, you know, Muslim or whatever religion fancies, whatever, whatever religion tickles your religious fancy, so to speak. And you can still meditate on top of those religious practices. So I don't think it needs to be a religious thing because I've had conversations with people before when they've asked me, like, how have I overcome my anxiety and what do I do for that? And when I mention meditation, you know, where I live right now, I'm, I'm in Tennessee and I'm kind of in, you know, part of the Bible Belt and religion is a really big thing down here. So there have been conversations that I've had with people when I've told them like, hey, like meditation is what really helped me pull, pull me out of it. Like I've tried a lot of other things and they just didn't do anything. And when I say meditation is the thing, it's like, oh, well, you have, have you tried Jesus? And it's like, cool, like I understand where you're coming from and I can respect that that's what's working for you. But like this doesn't have to be a religious thing, right? It's it's not that at all. So that's the perceived problem. I think the actual problem that that the actual problems rather that kind of come along with a lack of meditation is if you think about it like this, the calmest person, the happiest person in the world is only a thought away from being miserable, right? We're always just kind of one thought away from a different state of mind. So I think that's one of the problems with meditation is we don't realize that we're always just one thought away from a change in our state, whether it's for the better or, or not for the better. Another problem I think from a lack of meditation is sitting alone with our own thoughts is for most people very uncomfortable is for most people something that they don't want to do right i'm 43 i was born in 1977 so i can remember growing up without cell phones right i mean i can remember getting a computer with dial-up internet and waiting like three minutes to download a picture so i can remember like playing outdoors and getting my first video game system and how that all kind of like fascinate me and change from like playing outdoors, playing basketball, to like being on the computer and just blah, like, like zoning out with things. But I say that because I can remember a day and age when I would be bored. I remember being on the couch thinking like, oh my God, I'm so bored. Like this sucks. I want something to do. And those were usually like those long summer days. And it's, it's sitting alone in a room with just your thoughts, right? Not having your phone up, not having your computer open, not watching TV, not talking to anybody else, just sit alone in a room with your thoughts. 
How uncomfortable is that for you? Try it. If, you, if you've never tried that, pause this podcast and just see if you can start a timer for, for three minutes and see if you can sit in alone, in alone, sit in a room alone for three minutes without like fidgeting, without reaching for your phone, without being like distracted by some string of thoughts. It's not a very easy thing to do. And that's just kind of where it's like, it's hard for us to be alone with our thoughts and it's hard for us to be bored. But the, the nature of that and like the sad thing of it being hard for us to be bored is that boredom is often where like awesome ideas come from. Having boredom means you basically have like nothing else going on, nothing else vying for your attention. And you can just sit there and let whatever comes up, come up. And if you have a good quality of thought, you know, if you're, if you're an avid reader or if you're an active person or if you're a creative type, when you have that boredom, that's where some really cool shit can kind of bubble up from the ether. And it's just like, oh, wow, I never would have thought of that if you're constantly going as most of us are every day, right? So like that's another problem. If we're not actively med- meditating, we haven't cultivated that calm, we're probably afraid of our own thoughts and we're probably not very good at being bored. And if we're not being very good, if we're not very good rather at being bored, then we probably have this whole cycle. It's like a one, two cycle that most of us are completely unaware of. And it's, it's a thought pops up in your brain and then we take action. And then another thought pops up and then we take another action. And there's a million different examples I can come up with for this. It could be something as simple as like your You're in your car and you're driving and it's summertime right now, right? So you're in your car and you're driving and you think, man, I'm hot. That's the thought. So the thing before you even think about it, you reach for your AC, right? Or maybe the exact opposite. Maybe you're sitting in your home and you're a little chilly because the AC is on a little too high. So the thought comes up of like, I'm cold. And then without even thinking about it, you're getting up and looking for your jacket or your sweater. But it can be more insidious than that too. Like you could have someone at work do something that you didn't agree with or say something that you didn't agree with. And the thought comes up to, to say something snarky or to get frustrated or whatever it is. And you take that action without even thinking it right. Or even if you have a snarky thought pop up in your head and you don't take the action of saying the the snarky thing, usually like you can tell on somebody's face, like, "Uh uh-huh, what are you thinking right now? So it's that, that never ceasing thought, action, thought, action cycle that we all go through. Again, most of us are completely unaware of this. And this goes back again to the journaling episode that I, that I did earlier about like, this is water where if, if you're not even aware of the thing that you're doing, that is automatically triggering you, right? That's a really common word these days, triggered. I'm triggered. Like, well, if you're triggered, is it everybody else's responsibility to remove the trigger or is it your responsibility to fix the thing in you that's being triggered? Because again, if you can fix things that are triggering you, the more things you can fix inside of yourself that are triggering you, the more anti-fragile you, come, you can become, the less society can fuck with you, right? And like, think of it, the person who can kind of rise above the qualms of society like they're a powerful individual, right? So why not empower yourself by just becoming aware of that thought, action, thought, action cycle and see what you can do to, you know, improve your quality of thought and cultivating that calm. So, and this is where I got to move my head down here a little bit. Uh, This is where meditation will come in because what meditation does is again, if we have thought, action, thought, action, if we have that nonstop, like bop, bop cycle, meditation allows us to grow a space. So instead of it being thought, action, thought, action, it's like thought, action, thought, action. Like we're, we're creating a gap between the thought and the action. And in that gap between thought and action is peace. One of my favorite words is equanimity, right? And it's basically, I like it because it's a five syllable word, which is also it's pentasyllabic. That's another one of my favorite words, but equanimity is a pentasyllabic word, but equanimity just means like peace. You're, you're in a perpetual state of calm and nothing is fucking with you, whether it's, it's a great day or a bad day, like you're good, you're calm, you're chill. Everything is, is good. And equanimity is in that gap. So the more we can meditate, the more we can cultivate that gap and sit in that space, just like a cat finding a box and sitting its furry ass in that box. You can sit your happy ass in that space between thought and action and grow that gap and grow that equanimity, right? So what does meditation look like? Well, 
let's first go through my experience with it because obviously that's all all of us have is our subjective experiences with things, right? So my story with meditation, it's been an on and off thing for over 20 years. I started meditating when I was like 21 or 22. So about half of my life then, let's put it that way. So I started meditating because I was in a spot where I was going to a school in a new town. I didn't know anybody in the town. I was working like two or three part-time jobs. I was taking 18 credit hours. I was playing basketball for the team, didn't get along with the coach, didn't know anybody on the team and just, you know, really stressed out. Like I just, I just didn't have a whole lot of good stuff going on. I, I enjoyed playing basketball, but I played like you know, kind of street basketball. And I, I talked a little bit about that on my guest appearance on the Wise Asses podcast. I mentioned that in the last last episode. If you haven't listened to that, go listen to the Wise Asses. They're a great pair of guys. And that was a fun podcast to do. And I talked a little bit about my basketball upbringing. So that was all I had to really bring me pleasure. But even that, like, if, if anybody has played sports, you know that what you're doing in a playground is completely different than what you're doing in an organized setting, nine, nine times out of 10. So even the thing that was bringing me peace was becoming a piece of anxiety now for me. And I can remember going to a doctor because there were times like where I lived and the school I was going to was about like a 10 to 15 minute drive on a highway. And I remember driving on the highway and it was a, a very industrial area of Indiana. And I remember that that sounds like an oxymoron, an industrial area of Indiana, but there, there were some industry out in the cornfields out there. But I remember driving and I would be boxed in by semis, a two lane highway. There would be a semi in front of me, a semi behind me and a semi to the side. And that happened more often than I cared to remember. And I just remember having like that white knuckle, like just freak out kind of like, I want to get off the highway. I want to get off the highway kind of anxiety with it. And I went to a doctor at one point in time and, and was telling him about some of this stuff and just said like, I was really stressed out and like, you know, told him my situation, working two or three jobs, playing basketball, 18 credit hours, don't know anybody, blah, 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 blah. And the doctor's suggestion was, Hey, here's this free sample of Paxil. Try this. And if anybody's not familiar, I don't even know if that's still around, but Paxil I think is like a anti-anxiety medication. So he gave me this sample of Paxil and sent me out the door and I took it home and I just, there was no way, like I didn't even, even entertain the idea of potentially even taking one of those. I took it home and like threw it in the cupboard. I was like, yep, thanks. So never mess with that. And somewhere along the way I came across meditation and I just started just plain and simple, like laying down on my couch in my apartment I still remember laying down on the couch that I bought at a Goodwill store actually and, and laying there in the quiet for like 20 or 30 minutes at a time and sometimes I fall asleep, right? Because it's hard to not fall asleep when you're doing all that stuff and laying on a couch. But when I could stay awake through the whole thing, it would be a, a process of breathing in through my nose, breathing out through my nose and thinking about the air and the oxygen coming in through my nose and like meeting like the real world and the oxygen from the outside meeting my nose at the nostrils and then breathing out at my nostrils. And it was just this process of focusing. Sometimes it was focusing on my nose and the air coming in and coming out. Other times it was focusing on my chest and feeling my chest filling up and, and you know, like expelling air. You know, the same thing with my stomach. Sometimes I would feel my belly button go up as I breathe in and go down as I breathed out. But it's just focusing on that breathing. And over the course of about two or three weeks, I started to notice it was, it was one day. I remember like a, a holy shit kind of moment. I was on that same highway and I was boxed in the same that I had been dozens of times before that with a semi in front of me and a semi behind me and a semi to the side of me. And I just caught myself and I was like, oh shit, like I'm not in the least bit stressed out. Like I'm calm. I'm cool. Like I have equanimity right now, even though at the time I probably didn't even know what that word meant. But I just realized like I was really relaxed. I was really calm at that moment. And, and it was one of those moments where I was like, oh shit, like this meditation thing, there's something to this, this is working. So fast forward like two decades and me, you know, f finding, uh, I've talked about it before, like my, my 20 years of like drugs and alcohol abuse and everything and kind of massive depression and everything. And I would like touch base with meditation. I would kind of check in with it, but it was never anything that I just stuck with on a long-term basis, right? It was never anything that just became a part of my daily practice all of the time until about October of 2018. So we're coming up on three years, almost almost like to the, to the, to the month here soon. This is August of 2021 as I record this. 
So in August, uh, sorry, in October of 2018, I started using an app called the Waking Up app. And I tried other things in the past. I tried Headspace. I tried the Calm app and everything. And those were great, but it was it was kind of the same thing where I would feel good during the meditation and maybe even good for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes or hours afterwards. But it was like life always kind of crept back in somehow through the cracks, right? Through the through the facade of of what I was getting from the from the meditation. So it wasn't until using the Waking Up app and listening to a guy named Sam Harris kind of describe that the whole thing of meditation is like, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I'm, I'm putting words in Sam's mouth, but like the whole thing of meditation is like I said, to kind of grow that gap from thought and action. And the whole purpose of meditation is like, previous to that, my approach to meditation was like trying to cease thought. I was trying to make my brain stop, right? Stop the monkey mind because we have this part of our brain that's just, it's it's our our brain its job is to like a nonstop thought machine, right? This is why, again, where it's kind of hard to sit alone with your thoughts in a room because your brain is like, hey, bing, 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 bing. And you have all of these thoughts. I should do this. And what about that? And what if I do this? It's this, it's this constant nonstop thing. And Sam pointed out in some of the lessons and some of the guided meditations and lessons that you're never going to stop the thought machine that is your brain. What you're trying to do in meditation is become aware of the thoughts and hear me on this. It's, it's a difficult concept if you've not done this, but you're trying to become aware of the thoughts without identifying as the thoughts. So going back to the hot and the cold principle earlier, if you're sitting in a room and you think you're cold, the automatic, you know, the thought I'm cold pops up the action is go get a sweater. Like you do it without even thinking. But you can, one of the ways you could grow that space is to say like, hey, I'm cold, thought, and like, okay, cool. But like, I'm not freezing. Like, I'm, I'm mildly uncomfortable. And this goes back to that whole thing of like being anti-fragile in that if we as human beings live in this very narrow bandwidth of like te temperatures that we're comfortable in, right? We get inside from the hot and oh God, thank God we have AC. And we get inside from the cold and oh God, thank God we got heat. And we live in this very, very narrow bandwidth of cold. Well, you're, you're more fragile, the smaller that bandwidth of your comfort is, right? So as you're learning to not identify with the thoughts that you have, you can learn to embrace discomfort a little bit. Again, going back to the triggered thing, right? Someone does or says something that triggers us. That's literally the definition of being uncomfortable, right? You have discomfort because someone else triggered you or something triggered you. Well, if you can say, eh, I mean, I'm, I'm triggered and I'm upset, but like, I'm cool. I can sit with that. It's not going to make me fly off the handle. Again, that's a superpower. That's anti-fragility, right? You're, you're harder for someone to fuck with you if you're more anti-fragile. It's harder for someone to rattle you, to get the upper hand on you, to take advantage of you if you're harder to shake, if you're harder to rattle. And that's what it all comes down to is recognizing your thoughts for what they are. These things that your brain are just, it's, it's, it's like getting angry at your body for breathing, right? Your lungs breathe. That's what they do. Your lungs go, <gasps> that's what your lungs do, right? Your brain does the same thing except for breaths, it's thoughts. So the more that we can separate ourselves from those thoughts, the more that we can gain that superpower of anti-fragility and the less we get shook by other things, the less we get triggered by other things, the more power we have, the more the, the upper hand we have like on our side of the table, the more that you can do things, the more you can empower yourself, right? So that to me is that's the biggest realization. And that's been the biggest shift with meditation. If I've been doing it for whatever, 21, 22 years, it's really these last almost three years that has been a game changing experience for me. And I can sit down and meditate for 10 minutes and I will carry it with me for the whole day. Or I will, I'll not even, I won't even be meditating. I'll be driving. And it's just like, I'll see a car. I'm like, he's going to pull out in front of me. And sure enough, the car will be pulling out in front of me. And my wife is in the, in the passenger seat. He's like, Oh my God. It's just like, yep, yeah, no, it's all good. I know he was going to do it. Like, you're not mad. Like, no, I'm cool. Like it, it's not a big, I saw him coming like no big deal. So that's been the biggest realization is like, I can create that space between thought and action. And I can, can I can cultivate a calm in my mind by widening that gap between those two. And in that, in that gap, like I said, is peace is your equanimity. 
So, and again, just becoming aware of that gap. It's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, it happens in an instant, but sometimes it takes you years to get to that, right? Again, it took me like 20 years to get to it, but that's another reason why I've recommended the waking up to a few different people. And like, I don't think anybody has ever been like, Oh, wow, that's a great app. Most people are like, yeah, I just didn't get it. It wasn't for me. And they, they go to the calm or they go to the headspace, which again, that's where I started. Right. So start with those. Like, I mean, hell, if, if all you get out of meditation is like learning how to breathe a little bit better and reduce your anxiety, shit, I'd say that's a pretty good thing again, especially in today's day and age. So How do you meditate? How do you build a practice of meditation? How do you make this a regular thing in your life? Well, as I've been kind of mentioning, there's many different forms of meditation, right? There are, I mean, I'm, I'm shooting this, I'm out of my element here, but I would say there's easily hundreds of different types of meditation, right? What I was doing in the beginning, focusing on the breath would be probably more referred to as like Vipassana. What I do now is more referred to as like Dzogchen. And, and there are, dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of other types of meditations and variations of those in between those, right? So the form of meditation you do, I would not say is super important. I would say what is important is that you find something that you like and that you will do, right? Like my wife, I gave Holly uh, a free month pass to the waking up app. And I think she did it for, I don't know, like seven days or eight days. And she was like, yeah, it's just not for me. I'm not going to be like, you got to do waking up and like keep doing it and, and stick with it. I don't know where that voice came from, but like, I'm not going to like, like bully her into doing it. If she doesn't want to do it, find something that works for you. So like she did the call map for a long time. We got her like two different year subscriptions to it. And I think now what she does is she gets on YouTube and she'll find different meditations. Again, YouTube is a great resource, right? There's all kinds of free meditations on there. So the form of meditation you do, I don't think matters, right? Because there are all, there are all kinds of forms. There are all kinds of directions to it. There are all kinds of apps and teachers and classes and services and all of this different stuff. Find something that rings true to you. That's what you like. That's the most important thing. It's the same thing with a diet or a training regimen and find something that you enjoy doing and that rings true to you and stick with it. And if a day comes where it's like, yeah, I'm just not really feeling it anymore. Maybe you're graduating. Maybe you're growing. Maybe you should find a different form of meditation. Maybe all you need to do is again, sit quietly with your own thoughts for five or 10 minutes a day and just gather yourself, right? And just relax and block out the world and all of the distractions that are vying for your attention and pulling you in 18 different directions. So find that thing that rings true. And I say stick with it, right? Because some days you'll miss it. There are days that happen where I don't meditate at all, but I make damn sure just like the journaling episode, if I miss it one day, okay, it's not the end of the world. I'm going to do everything in my power to get it that second day. And there may be days where or weeks where I go like two days and I don't get it in or something like that. But if I've gone three days and I haven't done a meditation, it's like, oh shit, like Andy, you're slipping, like get back on it. So I will make sure that I do that. I don't think I've gone more than three days. I mean, I don't know. I don't track everything, but like I make it a point to come back to it. I make it a point to stick with it. But as you're sticking with it, look for signs of progress. For me, it was that initial being boxed in by the semis moment of like, oh shit, like I'm not even bothered right now. And now it's like a daily thing of, oh cool, I'm driving and like, I'm just totally present, right? And that might not make sense to a lot of you listening to this if you're not super experienced with meditation, but like there's no feeling like just being present because these moments, these, every one of these moments as I'm talking that are, that are just flying by, that's all we have. I don't want to like go down a rabbit hole with that, but being present is a superpower. So look for signs of progress. If it's, Hey, I'm breathing a little bit better during my workout, right? That might be from the meditation or, Hey, I have less anxiety or, Hey, this coworker that always pisses me off. Like I'm, I'm, I'm way more calm right now. Right. Or I didn't get triggered on social media. Somebody posted some shit and I wanted to say something back to him. I wanted to snap on him, but I just let it go. Right. Whatever it might be. And again, as you're looking for those signs of progress, it's, it gets real easy when things are going right to stop doing the things that got us there in the first place. So when things are going really well, if you do stop meditating, remember, always come back to it because it will always serve you. Even if it's times of like, hey, everything is really good right now. Keep it as a practice because it's the nature of us. Like we are 
basically just highly evolved chimpanzees, right? I think I've said it before on the podcast, like Elon Musk said, we're basically chimpanzees with supercomputers for brains. I'm a big believer in that, where it's like, we think we're super advanced and we think we're all high class and everything, but it doesn't take much to get a person to act like a complete asshole. So always come back to that state of meditation because it can help you remain in the driver's seat and, and have some higher level of like, you know, cognitive strength and and the upper hand as far as your quality of thought and cultivating that calm. So always come back to your meditation. So that is all I have for today. Episode number six, cultivating calm. So growing that space from your thought to action, guys, that's the benefit to meditation. And I promise you it's not sexy, but damn it, if you do this and you stick with it, you will tell me in five or 10 years that is like one of the most important things that that's it's a tenant of your life and you will not let it go. So that's all I've got for episode six. Um, we have another Q and a episode coming up soon with my buddy, Joe Holland. I should be getting our, our origin story in finally, uh, I believe this weekend. So I'm looking forward to recording that. And I've got at least another three or four more of these little short kind of like task episodes where I'm talking about cold showers and fasting and, and sleep quality and all these different things I want to talk about. So with that, that is all I have, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate every second that you donate to these podcasts. If anything I said in this episode helped you, please share it, um, screenshot it. You know, if you, if you can't share it with somebody, screenshot it and tag me on Facebook, tag me on Instagram. Again, Facebook, Andy Frisch or Nutrient Official. Uh, Instagram, Nutrient underscore official, Relentless underscore Andrew, because I'm a relentless motherfucker. But, uh, screenshot it, share it, give it to somebody that, that you know will help them. I appreciate every one of you. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Y'all have a great rest of your day, and I will talk to you soon. Later.